Hello and welcome to another episode of the Mark Moss Show where we talk about each and every week we talk about the decentralized revolution. Of course, we're talking about the way the world is changing rapidly right before our very eyes and we look at it through the lens of politics, finance, and technology. Those three things coming together and converging, of course, through all of history. It's technology that changes the world the most and of course the technology today is Bitcoin, the decentralized technology. I try to bring to you each and every week, you know, some education to help you see things and understand things a little bit better. Of course, some of the latest breaking news to keep you up to date because this is a fast moving market. And of course, also bring some of my friends in so you can listen to some other interesting people besides just me all the time. And so I am in the studio right now with Joe Consorti. You can find him on Twitter at Joe Consorti. Joe, thanks for joining me. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> round two, round two. Uh, we're, we're laughing. We had a little mix up in the studio before, so uh, we're getting it going again. But uh, if you've been following me on YouTube, um, well, first of all, if you're not following me on YouTube, what are you doing? Uh, just uh, go to YouTube, search Mark Moss, and uh, hit that subscribe button and that bell notification. The algorithm doesn't always like what I'm talking about, so uh, you know I need that help. Uh, go hit that, go check that out, and check out Joe on YouTube as well at the Bitcoin Layer. Did I say that right, Joe? The yeah. Bitcoin Layer, right? Yeah, we'll make sure to link that down in the show notes below. Uh, Joe's been helping me out, do some research, helping me dig up some charts and graphs and share that stuff with you guys on YouTube. Uh, he's a wizard on those things. So uh, check those out for sure. But Joe, you know, uh, we, we've been going back and forth. We've been sharing a bunch of uh, data back and forth. I thought it'd be great for us just to kind of like talk about it, discuss it. We haven't really got a chance to do that. And why not do it on the radio here? So a lot going on in the financial world. Um, you know, I've been doing content on YouTube since 2018 and uh, I'm sorry, yeah, since 2018, I started uh, kind of right in that bear market when it started. And by the end of 2019, man, there was like nothing to talk about. It was just like dead, you know? And then March of 2020 came and then it got really exciting again. And, and that's kind of where we're still at today. Uh, but a couple of things that I think uh, that we'll dive through, um, topics that you and I have talked about extensively, but maybe let's start with the first one, which is uh, this week everybody was excited well maybe not everybody but a lot of people were waiting to see what this new cpi this new consumer price inflation number was going to be and is inflation still going up or is inflation going down and it looks like uh, year over year it went down and month over month it went down what's the take on that of course so a lot of eyes were on the cpi report coming into uh the, the july cpi report obviously that gets released in august and Estimates were looking at it and saying that it was going to decelerate. It was going to go from 9.1 in June to 8.7 in July. And it actually fell even further than that. It fell down to 8.5, which was uh, a huge relief. Um, you know, looking at what the Fed has been doing, they've been raising interest rates at a higher rate of change than they, they have since the 90s. And so, you know, uh, everybody was sort of expecting markets to, to blow up. People were, you know, thinking that uh, they, they would have to hike even you know further than where they are now. Uh, but it looks like we're already seeing the fruits of the Fed's labor. It looks like inflation is already coming down and, and sort of responding to uh, all these tightening uh, interest rates uh, across the board. Month over month, the biggest driver of the CPI basket is actually energy. So if you take a look at food, uh, food prices actually increase slightly month over month. Good prices stay the same, uh, services prices stay the same, but energy dropped, and that that basically made up entirely for um, the the 0.6 per uh, 0.6 percent downshift in CPI. It was basically entirely energy prices, um, which is good because you know that's sort of what what's hurting Americans the most. Um, but again, and when you and when you say energy, you're talking about gasoline. Yeah, for the most part. Yeah. For the most part. oil, but really it's gasoline. That's what people buy. We people buy gas; they don't buy oil. So gas dropped quite a bit, which of course, after going up by those astronomical rates, to get a little bit of a pullback, I guess, is uh, pretty good. You know, one thing I see, uh, like uh, you've seen probably the stickers all over the gas pumps of Biden saying, "I did that," right? And so if like he's out there now uh, saying, "I did that," I lowered gas prices. Does that mean he has to be responsible for gas prices going up too? Like he can't take credit for dropping them if he didn't if he doesn't take credit for them going up, right? Hey, I mean that's what politics. Do they're they're selective about you know just about everything all the bad things that was the last guy and then all the good things you got to take credit for. Yeah, right, right. So I like to call CPI, which again for those listening is the Consumer Price Index. It's prices going up. You know how much you pay for as he's as Joe's saying here, gasoline going up, your steak going up, and uh, whatever your milk, whatever the stuff is that you buy. Um, 
I like to call it, instead of CPI, I call it CP lie, because <laughs> it's like so heavily manipulated that they can almost show you whatever they want. And so if you dig into that data, a couple things that look, that kind of stand out to me, one, right off the bat, I actually posted on Twitter earlier today. If you're not following me on Twitter, then what are you even doing? Uh, check it out at one Mark Moss. That's just the number one Mark Moss. And check out Joe while you're there at Joe Consorti. Um, but I, I put out on Twitter today, um, year over year, rents are up on average nationally 26.8% nationally. 26.8, in, in some areas even way higher than that, some, some as much as 100%. Um, that's, that's year over year. Um, and also there was an article that was out on Bloomberg that says that, um, that, home, that rents are so tight that it's at a, running about a 96 or 97% occupancy rate. People aren't moving out. Uh, they're staying where they are. And so we have this crazy high year-over-year -year inflation in, in uh, rates. Uh, ho homes are extremely tight. There's none opening up. And that makes up 25% of the basket. 25%. And I think they showed somewhere around like five or six percent for shelter. Do you, do you know anything about that? Right. Yeah. So when it comes to when it comes to like home price inflation and and these rents, a lot of these are a lot more sticky. Well, I wasn't talking about home price inflation. I was talking about the rent rent the rent rent price. Right. Yeah. So yeah. a lot of these are more sticky for the same exact reason that you mentioned. Um, you know, they, these are life's necessities. This is where people live, and so the likelihood of people moving out and deciding to become homeless, right? That's sort of the last uh, you know leg down in demand destruction that you see. That's sort of the last uh, decrease across the board in prices that you see is rent, right? Because people can, you know, they can forfeit all of their different luxury goods. They can forfeit going out on the weekends, but you know, it's a lot more difficult to find a place, uh, you know, that's cheaper than the place you're already living. Um, for families, that's more difficult, et cetera, et cetera. And so definitely like the last leg down we're going to see when it comes to this demand destruction, prices going down across the board, you know, chances are it's, it's, it's going to be rent that generally lags behind everything else. Mm, yeah, I just uh, so, so so you're absolutely right, and and I think we haven't even seen the, the the worst of it yet because to your point, it's sticky. So people typically sign one, two year leases, etc., and it's not until they move out that they can then raise those rents. And so we're seeing all across the nation, we're seeing um, when people move out is a forty percent increase, you know, in a, in a lot of cases. And so a lot of that will be happening as we go go along. But I'm just saying, we saw twenty six, almost twenty seven percent. Uh, and it's 25% of the basket, but somehow they showed like 5%. So that's why I call it CP lie. Um, but that's uh, under this new Fed guideline of being data dependent, right? They're looking at that. Another thing they're looking at is the um, jobs report. And you and I, we did some work on the jobs report. And that number is super manipulated. One of the things that people need to know about that is that there's, well, okay. So <laughs> how do they get the data? <laughs> Uh, always, always look at the data. Like, where do they get the data? So, with the with the with the rent price, where do they get that data? Well, they do a survey and they ask homeowners, "What do you think you could get for your house if you rented it out?" <laughs> well, I don't know who they surveyed. They didn't survey me. And if you look at rents nationally, you'll see some places are up 100%. Some places went down. So, uh, depending on where they get that sample size, they get a bunch of different answers. Um, now, going to this jobs data, they also run two surveys, right? to get that jobs data? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, there are several, several different surveys. Um, you know, you have initial jobless claims and then you have unemployment data, um, non-farm payrolls, all these different things. Um, you know, basically all of it is survey data. Um, one of the things that was especially surprising about the jobs data that released this last week um, was non-farm payrolls data. So unemployment is the tightest it's ever been. Uh, you know, in the last couple of decades, 3.5%. It hasn't dipped below 3.5% in, you know, several decades. This has sort of been the bottom. And you've got uh, non-farm payrolls data coming in at uh, over double what the expectation was. And so the labor market right now is uh, a lot stronger, uh, you know, than, than the Fed would like. Or, We've or, or so it seems. Hold that thought, Joe. We got to take a break. And so, Joe, uh, sorry for the uh, abrupt uh, change into the commercial, but you were talking about these non-farms payroll um, reports that came out and how it looked like the jobs market is extremely strong. And everybody was uh, patting themselves on the back over that, right? Yeah, that's exactly right. And, and some of these numbers are very misleading, especially non-farm payrolls. 
many people who I follow have been saying, uh, you know, people like Jeff Snyder have been saying that non-farm payrolls have lost their credibility through time. And taking a look at something like, okay, there's a, you know, there's a, uh, literally, non-farm payrolls were expected to come in with a $250,000 addition. They came in over double that at $528,000. You know, but at the same time, that initial jobless claims are ticking higher and higher and higher uh, every single month, right? Uh, the you know the biggest report that you probably want to keep an eye on when it comes to leading indicators is as to how the job market's doing is initial jobless claims and continuing claims. You don't want to take a look at uh, you know things like the unemployment rate that lag. You don't want to take a look at non-farm payrolls, which have you know lost their reliability over the last decade or so. Uh, you really want to look at you know who is filing for unemployment, who is filing these initial jobless claims. For me, that's that's sort of the highest signal indicator. Um, of course, you'll you'll never hear the people uh, in the mainstream highlight that, but as of right now, you know it's been ticking up pretty steadily since March. Yeah. So what I want to really get to is if the Fed is being data dependent. Everybody, unfortunately, I had uh, I think I talked about it on the radio a couple weeks ago. Um, which, by the way, if you missed, you can always catch my back episodes on uh, the podcast. Just search Mark Moss Podcast. You can find it on any podcast player. Um, but I, I, I kind of talked about how insane it was for us to sit there and watch the Fed to come out and tell us what the price of money will be and how it's almost as insane as trying to watch uh, some groundhog come out of the ground and tell us what the weather's going to be. Uh, but yet here we are. And so everybody wants to hang on the word of the Fed. What are they going to do? And so looking at those two data points, this, the inflation rate, the CPI, and now, so we have lower inflation, which is what they want. They're, they're making positive progress down, um, which would then make you think maybe they could ease off of their um, tightening program. We'll call it that, raising rates. Um, but, then, but then we also have this strong jobs report, which is manipulated, and we believe it's false, but they've got it, which then gives them room to increase so we kind of have these two different data points that let them now go either way. Now we're kind of like inconclusive almost. Yeah, that's exactly right. So I, I actually, st- and this is the benefit of, of writing your, your newsletter literally the day as the economic releases come out because I was writing a newsletter before, the, uh, before CPI came out about how the Fed's runway was extended because with a strong jobs market, if their goal is to tame inflation and the jobs market is extremely strong, then they got the green light to extend their hiking runway you know, well past 3%, well past neutral under restrictive territory, that gives them the green light. But then with the CPI release coming in lower than anticipated, that gives them the red light because it shows that their tightening is working. There's no real need to continue slamming on the gas if inflation is already decelerating, right? So, you know, it's sort of this, it's this, it's this, it's this odd game. At the same time with a strong labor market, they can continue tightening, but with fighting inflation, they can't tighten too much. Deflation's already accelerating, and the last thing they want is deflation. The last thing they want to do is go too far and send markets into a huge deflationary, uh, deflationary event. So um, I did a video recently, um, maybe it was... I do so many of them, but I was talking about the difference of uh, deflation versus disinflation. Mm-hmm. And so that's uh, two words that are thrown around. A lot of people maybe don't understand what they are, but deflation is the opposite of inflation. So inflation, now, first of all, I reject the definition of inflation. Inflation is the monetary supply going up. <laughs> that's the Austrian definition of it. Uh, trying to use that as consumer prices going up is a little bit wrong. But anyway, um, if, if uh, inflation is consumer prices going up, then deflation would be the opposite, which is prices going down. Whereas disinflation is still having inflation, but at a slower rate. And so what we're seeing right now is disinflation. Instead of going up at 9.1%, it's down to 8.5%. But nothing goes up and down in a straight line. So uh, a lot of people are asking the question, has inflation peaked? Um, What do you say about that? Of course. So for me, potentially, the reason, <laughs> the reason that I, and, 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 and I guess I should say I should say over what time frame you always have to ask yeah, that question, right? Has it peaked for this year? Or has it peaked for this, this decade? <laughs> yeah, for me, I think it's I think it's, uh, it's it's peaked this year, at least for this cycle. The reason I say that is because um, energy is what's re- what really drove these these increases. And of course, when you're making goods, energy is an input in that. And so basically taking a look at commodities, especially commodities that are used in end products, talk about copper a lot. You and I have talked about copper before. Uh, because it's used as, uh, as an input in so many end products, you can sort of look at this as the bellwether of, okay, are, are prices going to increase across the board or decrease across the board and what that's going to look like. And since June, uh, copper has fell very precipitously. I don't know the exact percentage. 
uh, but it's it's really fallen off of its highs. And so what that tells me is, okay, if a lot of this inflation that we've seen since the start of 2021 has been driven by huge increases in energy, energy prices, which in my mind, you know, that's that's a supply issue. And we're starting to see the commodities that cause that um, consumer price inflation to come down. Then I think that's leading and telling me personally that, yeah, for now, consumer price inflation this year uh, has peaked and, and is headed back down. Hmm. Now, I do want to make a note again. I, I put this on Twitter the other day, too. Again, follow me on Twitter at one Mark Moss and follow Joe at Joe Consorti. Um, but I put on Twitter, I said, hey, just remember, uh, for everyone who's not uh, not so sure, uh, just if inflation comes down from 8.5 now to 5.5, doesn't mean prices. So that's the disinflation versus deflation. Doesn't mean prices are coming back down. It means they're still going up just at a, just at a slower rate. Um, I, I, I might I might agree with that. I think maybe we've seen the height of uh, inflation for this cycle, although, like I said, it's like completely false anyway. Because to the point of I made of of, uh, of the shelter category, which is twenty five percent of the basket, is up by twenty six percent, and we also saw foods up ten percent. So I mean, like, how is food up ten percent? Shelters up twenty six percent, but somehow gas brought it all the way back down so anyway it is what it is but um i'd say maybe maybe for this rest of this year we might see that uh, but i've also gone out and said that i think we this might be some of the lowest inflation we see for the decade and so back to this kind of nothing goes up and down in a straight line i think you know we're we're, we're retreating but i think we're still going to go higher over over time i think it's the only way i don't know what do you think about that Potentially. I mean, there are two narratives. There's this narrative of, you know, this consumer price inflation sort of on like this endless path to infinity because, you know, hyperinflation is the only way. We have way too much debt right now. Um, if you take a look, if you plot uh, gross domestic product against all of publicly held liabilities, you can see, OK, so so our debt that we have to pay interest on is climbing rapidly and our GDP is is not even remotely close. So there's this school of thought that we have too much debt as of right now, and the only way out is through this implicit default of, of printing in order to pay for it. There's that school of thought, and then there's a the school of thought that the inflation we're seeing now isn't necessarily the it, it is of course the sim uh, that I'll I'll be better in my words the consumer price inflation we're seeing now um, might be partially the symptom of you know injecting the economy with 14 trillion, but also partially supply driven. And I think you know we we're going to see some relief in CPI purely because that supply driven component seems to be alleviated for the time being. But I think in the long run, um, the, you know, the debt levels is, is going to be a real concern. And I think, you know, one of the ways out will be through this com continued implicit default of inflating the money supply. Um, so before we took the break, we were talking about has inflation peaked or will it go higher? The question that you always have to ask is over what time frame? Bonds are horrible. Bonds are great. Well, over what time frame? You know, um, and so you kind of have to look at that like uh, bullish on Bitcoin or bearish on Bitcoin. Well, over what time frame? Um, and so if as I believe that we're in this decentralized revolution, so the pendulum swings on a 250 year time frame, and we've maxed out centralization. And what we've seen is that um, over the last really, you know, 100 years, maybe more specifically 50 years, um, we've had massive inflation as an Austrian definition of increase in the money supply, uh, which is inflationary, more money chasing limited goods. Um, to offset that in the United States specifically, but most of the developed world, the West, we've offshored all of our manufacturing, all of our high paying jobs. So now a $50,000 job is $8,000 offshore or $100 parts now eight bucks, you know, made offshore. And so we've had this deflation um, because we've been able to globalize. But if the world starts to deglobalize, which it's already happening and I believe will continue to happen. And we have to now onshore those jobs again and onshore that manufacturing again, which again is already happening. And you see this with the, with the chip manufacturing and uh, even with mining and things like that. Um, even the U.S. is sourcing now lithium, I'm sorry, uranium in the U.S. So we're starting to see all this happening. So as that continues to happen, all of the benefits of the globalism and the deflation will then reverse and then we'll have inflation. So that's kind of my uh, statement on that. I don't know if, if you have a comment on that. Of course, yeah. I think what, you know, bringing a lot of these industries back to the United States and, and deglobalizing, we're definitely on the track to that. You're seeing what happens when you have too much dependence on one entity. You're seeing it in Europe and it you know, proliferates everywhere else. Um, you know, in, in uh, several other nations. And obviously that is inherently inflationary and it's a type of inflation that is more entrenched as well. It's a type of inflation that doesn't just go away like, uh, you know, consumer driven inflation uh, or uh, CPI inflation that you can just, you know, get away with the snap of a finger with a, with a little bit of demand yeah. destruction. Um, yeah, no, I, I definitely agree with you there. 
Yeah, and, and you know, again, I mean, the, the reason why I reject the prices going up is because there's, there's trillions of prices, and there's trillions of reasons why those prices could go up on certain things or down. Uh, like Walmart uh, now is trying to change over their inventory. They realize they bought all the wrong inventory. Now they want to get rid of a lot of their durable goods, and they want to move back to kind of, kind of consumer staples, for example. And the CEO announced that they're going to basically fire sell all their inventory just to clear it out. So, like, well, the prices just got marked down on that. Like, uh, that wasn't on the bingo card. Like, I didn't, I didn't expect that prices would go down because they overbought in one category and they need to fire sell it, right? So, like, there's a trillion prices. There's a trillion reasons why uh, prices could go up or down on any of those trillion things, um, which, again, it's a little bit uh, crazy. But, again, they, they try to classify in two areas, right? So demand pull or cost push. So when the costs go up to the points that you made about commodities, when, when the cost to get the commodities out of the ground, the commodities goes up, transportation, all that, those push the costs, costs of things up. And then there's demand pull. When there's too much demand, then it pulls the price up as well. On the cost push side, and back to the jobs report, um, if the Fed seems to be trying to crush demand, which is basically what they're trying to do, they've, they've said it, I've talked about it many times, they want to crush the stock market asset prices to kind of do this reverse wealth effect so we don't spend as much money. Um, would you, first of all, would you agree that, that they, I mean, they've said that, right? They're trying to demand, uh, crush demand, yeah. right? So um, then you have this jobs report that came out very strong and actually wages went up by what, 0.5%. Yeah. So wages going up is actually the opposite of what they want yes. because wages going up leads to inflation. That's exactly So right. it almost seems like the Fed, what the Fed and the government want is for our wages to actually go down which is the opposite of what we, the people, would want. That's right. Yeah, in order to, I mean, we talk about this uh, demand, demand pull inflation uh, in 2020 when we had all this fiscal and monetary stimulus. Now, all of a sudden, not only is the labor market rip-roaring, but everybody has all of this income to go out and spend it. Um, and yeah. so that was a component alongside these supply shocks, which led to this multi-decade high inflation. Now, what will continue to allow this to happen? A strong labor market, right? If the labor market continues being strong, then uh, you know inflation may stay entrenched. And so what the Fed is looking for is the reason they're doing this so aggressively is partially to break the back of the labor market to increase the amount of people who are out destitute on the street. Uh, and so taking a look at a strong labor market with, like you mentioned, average hourly earnings going up month over month, 0.5%, year over year, 5.2%, that's huge. Wage price inflation is one of the, the, the parts of inflation that they hate the most, and that's one of the ones that they're targeting with this demand. <laughs> so, uh, let, me just, let me just reiterate what Joe said there. The wage price inflation is the one they hate the most. So that means your pay going up is what they hate the most. That's what they have to stop. So um, the prices of goods are going up. Uh, congratulations, they went down. Inflation slowed a little bit. So now it's only going up by 8.5%, but your pay went up by 0.5%. So that means that your cost of living is going up, but your pay isn't keeping up. So you know that means that, the, that your um, quality of life goes down. That means you buy less things. At 8.5%, that means on the average, it, it, on the average American, it costs them about $327 per month to have the exact same lifestyle they had the month before. So if you make $32 an hour, that's 10 extra hours a m in the month you have to work just to have the exact same lifestyle that you had the month before. Those are 10 hours that you could have spent with your wife or your kids. 10 hours you could have spent in the gym with Joe. I know Joe loves to be in the gym. <laughs> 10 hours you could have been going to school to increase your education, to start a side business. That's your life that's been stolen because of the inflation. Is that insane? All right, let's, uh, let's reframe this a little bit, Joe, um, because other than a couple nerds like me and you, um, what the heck do most people care about CPI? Right? Uh, what, what does that mean? They know the prices went up. Like, that's all they really care about. Or probably more people that are tuned into this, they, they're trying to figure out where the market is going because markets are forward looking, right? So, um, discounting mechanisms, as they're called, right? So, what does this mean for my retirement account? <laughs> my stocks, my, my house, my assets, uh, based off of this information? Does the Fed. Uh, does the Fed have this more neutral position and now maybe there's this soft landing they're able to kind of thread the needle to? Like maybe their backs aren't as forced as people thought they were? 
So potentially, yeah, that's coming off of the CPI report especially, we saw a lot of moves in forward-looking interest rate markets, and I'll explain this in a way that, that makes it so like, you know, why should you care about all of this? Well, what the Fed's doing right now is they're, they're essentially, in the simplest of terms, they're removing liquidity from the economy by making it uh, more expensive to borrow. Um, you know, at a, in, in very layman terms. And so one of the things you're seeing- More expensive right, to borrow by pushing their interest rate higher. Yes. Right. And so basically there are these futures markets, particularly federal funds futures, which let you take a look at what the market is pricing in that the Fed is going to do, basically. And so Fed funds futures, um, originally they were at a much higher terminal rate. So they were predicting the Fed would have to hike much higher uh, and that it would be much further out. So not only would, would it be a higher term rate, but it would be a slow grind to get there. And now with the CPI report, basically the markets are saying the Fed is looking at slowing consumer price inflation, and they're understanding that to some extent they're cooling the economy, which is what they want. And so interest rate futures markets are telling us now that they're going to be able to get to 3.5% roughly as a terminal rate. Right now we're at 2.5% Fed funds, and that terminal rate will be reached uh, late this year or Q1 next year, which means as of right now, because markets are forward looking, risk markets are forward looking. They're taking a look at what these futures markets are saying because uh, rates are also forward looking. But essentially, the reason risk assets have bottomed and they've risen, the NASDAQ is up 16, 17% from the lows. The reason Bitcoin seems to be catching a bit of a bid is because the markets are understanding that the Fed is going to pause late this year, early next year. And that's what the data is saying. I'm not making outlandish yeah. predictions that are, you know, not based on data. The reason that risk yeah, gets let's 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 hold let's up. let's hold that thought right there, and then I want to come back and let's, we'll talk about Bitcoin specifically. You said it's catching a bid. There was something from a Bloomberg analyst that came out today that I want to talk about as well. The way that uh, no, now the market sort of thinks the Fed will probably uh, raise into next year and risk on assets or I should say risk uh, risk on assets are starting to catch a bid. Bitcoin's been catching a bid. It's up from well, as low as 17,000 now up to, I think, about 24-ish um, range. Um, and so uh, the NASDAQ is also pumping back up, which is also one of those risk on assets. So you're starting to see that is coming back to life. Um, I think a question a lot of people are asking, um, we're back into bull market territory. <laughs> So we, were, we, went, we went into bear market area. Now we're supposedly we're back into bull market territory. Um, is this one of those just deep uh, bull, uh, bear market uh, fake outs? So in my purview, no, it isn't. I think, we, you know, probabilistically, of course, there is a scenario where, you know, the Fed Prob comes out. Probabilistically, that's yeah. the key word. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. We, yeah. we can never be definitive. You know, we always got to give yeah. both scenarios. There's a situation right now where the Fed uh, comes out later this August. Jerome Powell is going to do some forward guidance. At, he's speaking at Jackson Hole. Um, and there, there is a scenario where he says labor market's too strong. Right now, the market's interpreting our, uh, our, you know, our Fed speak as dovish. We're not dovish. We're, we're committed to going to 3-5 and beyond. If that happens, then you know this is a bear market rally and, and risk pukes a little bit. But if you know, let's say uh, September CPI again comes in low, Fed speak is dovish once again. Then you know we could see again a pause late this year, early next year, and that's what that's what rates markets are telling us. So i I'm leaning towards the latter, where this is more of a trend shift towards risk on than a bear market rally. But of course, you know we we've always you know got to be probabilistic about these things. Now, Bitcoin has been trading like a risk on asset. It's basically been moving just like almost in lockstep um, correlated with the NASDAQ. Um, you know, we've talked about this quite a bit, but um, there was an article I saw of um, there was a Bloomberg analyst that came out and said that he thinks that Bitcoin is likely to transition to a risk off asset at the second half of um, 2022. He said it's a. Uh, Likely rally, Bitcoin will likely rally alongside gold and treasury bonds, according to Michael Glone, a senior commodity strategist at Bloomberg. Um, what do you say about that? So over at the Bitcoin layer uh, on YouTube and on Substack, one of the things that I talked about 
three or four weeks ago was Bitcoin tracking very closely with global liquidity and sort of moving in and out with global liquidity. Um, one of the, th the the way that Bitcoin is traded by the guys with all the money, right? You know, we, we like to think that that you and I trade in size and we move the Bitcoin price, but we don't. Ultimately, it's these huge funds that are trading Bitcoin. We, we call that we call that the difference of dumb money, which is Joe and I and you, whoever's listening, and then the smart money. That's the big money, right? That's right. And so right now, this is sort of an informational arbitrage. You and I see Bitcoin as debasement insurance, where we understand that you know this uh, this fiat system is sort of programmed to you know debase because of our debt loads and fiat, uh, and Bitcoin is absolutely fixed, programmatically scarce. So we understand it as debasement insurance. Big funds don't trade it that way yet. And so there's this informational arbitrage that we've been able to catch on for the last 12 years that Bitcoin has had a price ascribed to it. But the reason that tide might start to change is you start to see institutions coming into the mix and, and potentially viewing Bitcoin uh, you know, as uh, something they like to allocate to as well. You saw BlackRock partner up with Coinbase specifically to offer not crypto, Bitcoin uh, to their clients right. through a private trust. And so I think that's a key, that's a key piece right there. Yeah. Not crypto, Bitcoin. That's exactly right. I think through time that window will close and Bitcoin will transition into a risk off asset because ultimately more people are going to catch on. Uh, you know, one of the end games is highly inflationary for the dollar. And I think over time, more people are going to catch on that Bitcoin is the solution to that. And slowly but surely, that gap is starting to change from Bitcoin being risk on to Bitcoin being risk off. Yeah, I would agree. And one, one thing that you said I think is super crucial for everyone to grasp onto is that our informational arbitrage. And so um, you always need to have an edge. If you want to compete in sports or you want to con compete in business or you want to compete in investing, you have to have an edge, right? One little thing that makes you better in one area than somebody else. If you don't know what your investing edge is, that means you don't have one. <laughs> And what, what I think Joe is referring to is this informational arbitrage is Joe and I, we spend a lot of time studying Bitcoin, and so we have an edge. We see what Bitcoin is or could become while most people don't. And so that gives us a little bit of an edge or an advantage there. And so that um, just think about that. And, and I would agree with you, Joe. I mean, I think um, to your point, we've already seen it as that. And to the point of this Bloomberg analyst, he's saying the same thing, um, that uh, in a severe recession, uh, Bitcoin will shine and people will start to see that it's this... Um, risk off asset moving from risk on to risk off and i say it's it's been trading like a nasdaq stock but it's not that um one more thing i want to talk about we have a couple minutes left um have you did you look at that new uh stable sats i know you do you guys do a lot of research into uh the lightning and, and stuff like that have you looked at the el salvador stable coin that they're trying to release not extensively i've heard of it i've seen a couple of headlines but not extensively yeah, so they're doing something like uh, perpetual swaps, like is what BitMEX used. So um, if you traded on, on BitMEX, I'm not even sure if they're around anymore. I know they closed off to American consumers a while ago, but basically they had like X BTC. So it was like a synthetic BTC, and it was like somehow set the price off the synthetic perp, perp swaps. I don't really know a lot about it. I guess yeah, you, don't, you don't know that much about it either. Yeah, no, not a whole lot. I mean, ultimately... The more the more on ramps into Bitcoin, the better. I think the development you're seeing across Bitcoin and Lightning as of right now is quite remarkable. Uh, you know, over at Lightning Labs, they have a protocol going called Taro. It's an active development that would allow you to issue assets such as stable coins over Bitcoin and Lightning. So somebody in a country like El Salvador would be able to hold dollars in Bitcoin in the same exact wallet, like benefiting from the privacy, the security of the Bitcoin network. Uh, there are numerous, numerous things going on in Bitcoin right now um, that are, you know, again, slowly inching us towards this future where Bitcoin is, is potentially a base layer of money. Right. Yeah. One of the things, I mean, I think about with Taro is like before the internet, I mean, I, I don't know, I need to do some research on this because I've been talking about it quite a bit, but, um, you know, somewhere in the 70s or 80s, I'm guessing, stock certificates were actually still certificates that they would send to you <laughs> before the internet. We had like actual bare instruments. Um, and I would have the stocks. I remember, I remember having stock certificates. Um, and I'm not that old. <laughs> and I would have them. And then that's a bare instrument. If I want to give you the stock certificate, you have it. And so like, you could almost see like stocks being issued on that tarot blockchain. And then I could have custody over that stock certificate. And then I could exchange it with you over that lightning layer, which is a layer above the Bitcoin network, something like that. That's right. Yeah, there's a future where that's conceivable. And the, and the great thing about that is 
people who don't have access to traditional financial rails uh, will now have access to all these different instruments that are uh, you know, issued over Bitcoin. Anybody who has a Bitcoin wallet has access to these. Um, and even if you're not a fan of these other assets, even if you don't want uh, you know, the, the doom scenario where people start issuing you know, NFTs and things on Bitcoin, any increase in demand for transactional capacity right, will come with an increase in liquidity on Bitcoin. So let's say uh, the United States Treasury begins issuing they start you know, doing treasury auctions on Bitcoin. There's a structural demand for United States treasuries. That liquidity will now come onto Bitcoin. And it might not be somebody like the United States Treasury. It could be a corporation that decides to issue uh, you know, their, their bonds atop the Bitcoin blockchain through something like Tarot. That whatever demand there is for those bonds, which I can tell you there's a lot, uh, the, United, the United States dollar capital market is the largest capital market in the world. That would come with increased demand for Bitcoin liquidity. And with that, you know, price goes up. Yeah, the rising pride, the, ri the rising tide lifts all the boats at that point. And I would agree. I mean, uh, I know a lot of people in the Bitcoin space specifically think it's like anything else than Bitcoin is ridiculous. That's the only asset you need to own. But the reality is, is that we still need progress in other areas. And we still need other types of businesses. We still need goods and services. And so people will always be willing to invest into those those goods and services. And so we'll need a way to figure that out as well. I've also seen some stuff about even some governments issuing their currencies on it. So potentially like a Japanese yen or like a euro or something like that. And then it could move their own currency could move over a Bitcoin rail, but still keep their currency in place, which is pretty amazing to think about. And if you think about the dollar as just a payment network, um, then you can start to see how that works out. Anyway, that's a whole different conversation. You're listening to The Mark Ma Show. We've been talking about the decentralized revolution, how the world is changing from centralization to decentralization, of course, being led by Bitcoin. I've been in the studio with Joe Consorti. Check him out on Twitter, at Joe Consorti. Say what's up, that you heard us here. Of course, I'm Mark Moss. That's what we got for you today. Thanks so much for listening. Since you've stayed to the end, I know you like this video, which means you're probably going to really like this video right here and this video right here.